challenging. Uh, just thinking about your actual network, your physical stores, and changing that to support something that can be really competitive, not just the software. And I think you raised a really interesting point there, Julia. If I, if I went to a retailer and said, hey, guys, I'm a new supply chain guy on the block. I think your stores are part of my logistics network. And now I'm going to do a network planning strategy. And actually, I'll probably end up closing a few and moving them around and, you know, all the normal stuff that, that logistics guys do. Can you imagine how difficult a conversation that might be? Yeah. But <laughs> yes. the reality is... In the design of dynamic distribution networks, the store is a logistics asset and it must be seen to be this. And all these paradigms around, no, I'm managing the store, the store does this, blah, blah, blah. Because many of the tasks that we're asking the store to do are of a extreme logistic content. It's surprising to me that not all retailers have chief supply chain officers in their C-suite. That is surprising considering the Amazon effect and the fact that consumers in the developed world are expecting one, two-day shipping from every retailer. Yes, and that should be a big trigger point. I've been advocating that not only should Prime go from two to one day, while they've got all this stock they've invested into their system to allow that to happen, they actually should just see, if I just put a little bit more stock into my system, can I actually get the same day? How possible is it to get... And certainly some of the assortment could be same day, and that would really scupper... I mean, Target already on the same day. Walmart gets there in various ways. If Amazon could get there, not just in the high urban areas, but more widely than that, certainly some areas with a choice assortment, many retailers would say, how do I get to same day? I have to really rethink my business. I have to reimagine every element of this because the silos, the way we've organized since 1927 and the model that was put out there, it's not going to serve us well in the remainder of the digital age. Welcome and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gary Newberry. I'm a senior executive on call helping businesses in the make move sale flow of consumer goods and services. My purpose is to inspire business leaders, particularly those within the consumer products and retailing space to think big, be bold, scale, adapt and win one epic supply chain transformation at a time. There's additional content available through my website, retailaid.ca or on my YouTube channel, Retail Aid. Be sure to check it out. As a business world faces much volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity, Organisations need to be tapping into resources with an inside edge on transitioning their teams to be agile, innovative and digital with thought leaders, experts and senior executives who have mastery of operational turnarounds and strategic transformations to help reorientate their enterprises. There's great material to get through here, so let's get started. Rethink Retail the evolution of retail in today's connected world. Welcome to the Rethink Retail Show, your source for the most recent trends and innovations in commerce. Join host Julia Raymond, Global Director of Research at Valtech, a global digital agency focused on strategy and transformation in retail, as she explores the most recent trends and innovations in commerce. This episode of Rethink Retail, sponsored by Valtech, where experiences are engineered. Hi, today we're kicking off another episode of Rethink Retail with my guest Gary Newbury. Gary is one of Canada's top internationally seasoned end-to-end -end retail supply chain executives. Gary, it's great to have you on the show. Great to be here, Julie. I'm very honored and privileged to speak to you today. Definitely. We'd love to have you. And I'd like if you could kick us off by just giving us a brief overview of your background and what you do. Okay. As you say, my name is Gary Newbury. I'm a retail supply chain strategist and serial transformation executive. I have an exceptional track record of clarifying mission critical challenges within the retail supply chain, developing new fulfillment strategies, and single-minded focus on rapid execution of business change, resulting in development of distribution networks which are scalable, drive consumer value, and deliver success during periods of business transformation. During the 17, 18 years as a retail transformation consultant, I worked either as an interim C-level player or as a management consultant. One of the last pieces of work which I did with GFS was to onboard the m and food market chain into their distribution network. And I couldn't help 
to spot some quite interesting disconnects within the retailer. They're a, a fairly good quality retailer in their own right. But being up close and personal and seeing the disconnect between what M&M were doing in their flyer and what stock we had on the shelf and mm-hmm. the disconnect there, it made me feel I must get back into bricks and mortar here. There's so much opportunity in Canada to really jump start what we're doing here because it does sometimes feel that we're in the 80s still uh, right. in terms of retailing and certainly as I go into stores here I still think oh my gosh this is what I was used to in the UK in the 80s <laughs> where's the technology where's all this digital experience where's this great customer experience thing I'm meant to be inheriting as I walk through the tick impression zone it's not here exactly <laughs> That's a little bit of my background and certainly my motivation to work with retailers to really make a big change here. Definitely. And from your perspective, you said it's crazy to see some of these retailers and it feels like we're back 30 years ago in the UK in terms of the lack of digital experience offered in the store. And how much do you think supply chain relates to that? I think that This is almost a jaundiced view from outside that when I talk to bunches of retailers, people in the supply chain, they all talk about technology, AI, you know, internet things and all. It's great, wonderful technology, but they never really describe the process. They don't spend time saying, hey, we're going to join up demand planning to our warehouse, to our transportation, to our e-commerce, whatever. They don't seem to spend any time describing the process. Because the mm-hmm. technology only works if you've actually got a process to base it on. And technology can only work on big data if we actually understand what each column heading stands for. So we can understand how to use that column of data. Because if the data's rubbish, guess what? You put AI on it, it's still going to come out with rubbish output, garbage. Garbage in, garbage out. Absolutely. I think there's a big miss here. The key is that to focus on process will help deliver the customer experience that we talk about, but we don't describe how we're going to achieve it. We just talk that it's out there. Surely we're doing it because we're telling everybody we're doing the customer experience, so it must be true. Technology is only there to speed up the process, but if we haven't got a process that we can recognize and we build, if we put technology into what we're doing today, all the technology is going to do is to open up how bad we are. And we see that when we think about SAP implementations and people have a very disconnected view of how their actual process works, what improvements they want to make to that actual process to get them to where they want to be. And they just shortcut it by saying, well, I think that should work. Configure it this way and see what happens. Right. Are you seeing, because I know you mentioned SAP and the technology they rolled out years ago, but there were some hiccups. And I did just see a report, a news report, I think it was from last week, that IBM has a new supply chain suite product that they just released that it basically is combining their Watson AI with IBM blockchain. It often sounds to me like there's a solution waiting for a problem to happen. And the problem is, if we don't think about process, you know, IBM, SAP, whoever, can develop these great ideas in technology terms. But until a retailer actually sits down and says, what is the process we want to enable here? How do we get there? How do we get ourselves to use that process to implement the technology to make us faster at it so we can create a competitive advantage, even if it is in the short term? So I've used parts of the SPSS, which is part of the IBM. It's all very whiz-bang kind of technology, but putting that into the hands of people who can't manage processes is a challenging thing to think about, to say the least. Totally, and could in some cases be a recipe of success because it sounds like you're saying there's so many facets of the organization that are affected by technology and you really have to have the process as your foundation. Yes, and the thing that we're kind of dodging around, I'm surprised it hasn't already come out, the silos. Right. You know, retailers are highly siloed. You know, you've got your merchandising silo, you've got your store operation silo, you typically have you know some kind of marketing silo depending on how prominent marketing has been within the organization they seem to be the key things and underneath it all if you imagine like a square with three vertical columns and a horizontal the supply chain sits down the bottom somewhere but it Mm -hmm. does touch all these different teams all these different silos we only talk about this typically we only talk about retail supply chain when it goes wrong and go oh yeah need to do something about our retail supply chain it doesn't seem to always surface as a big thing that we could either take advantage of we could 
do something to prevent it going wrong or more importantly it's something which can deliver a huge amount of consumer value. Well, do you think that supply chain, when you're talking about improving it and getting to that next capability level, is more incremental, speaking in generalizations, or is it something where sometimes these retailers just need a complete overhaul of the systems they're using? Yeah, I think it's a lot. And the reason why I say that is that all research I've done reading loads of things, talking to lots of people, including the people on the more marketing side of a retail spectrum, they're all seeing that the place component of the marketing mix, you know, I'm still brought up on a diet of four Ps, you know, the price, promotion, okay. product, yeah. and the place. The place has become increasingly more important to retail businesses. The place has traditionally been the store. As soon as you cited the store, tick, has it given us a competitive advantage? Yeah, so if we're target, oh, we're ahead of a Walmart. We displaced Walmart from getting onto this junction. We've nailed it. Well, the place isn't just the store anymore. It's wherever the consumer wants to pick up their product, wherever they want to consume their service. So the mm -hmm. place is becoming increasingly important. So as I described that strip at the bottom, I actually want to encourage retailers to kind of change it up a bit and put the supply chain as a vertical thing and the other functions as horizontals alongside that supporting the fulfillment of the organization it's going to be centered around how it well fulfills the requirements given to it that is all the gambit of the supply chain if we look at something like target to an extent they were quite disastrous in canada they had a change of management and they were just my favorite retailer in terms of what they're doing in the supply chain area. Oh, okay. You're saying Target does an excellent job. Typically yeah, every, in every time I read something about Target, it's, yeah, I'm ticking the box. They're doing exactly what I would do. And the only thing I'd say to them is you need to figure out a better way than in-store picking of e-commerce orders. There needs to be, and hopefully we may have a chance to talk about alternatives to that in due course. But how they've moved the stock towards the store. Let's assume the store is correctly positioned. Why wouldn't the inventory be correctly positioned for supporting the local market with e-commerce orders? They're doing a great job. Are you saying specifically maybe uh, where their warehouses are located? Or are you talking more about just the ability? The, or? My understanding is this. When they receive an e-commerce order, they process it by in-store picking. So they send one of the store associates and go, oh, we've got an order from Mrs. Jones. Let's run around with your trolley and <laughs> pick the order and get it to the till. I don't know exactly how they do the tilling process. And then they probably call shipped or they do some technology and ship turn up and they pick it up and organize the pickup and deliver it to the residential address. Uh, extremely manual, right? Yes. And if the truth be told, if they've been getting something like 5% year over year comp store growth, and they're just heading into peak. Can you imagine a situation you're going down the grid format and you've got a ton of pickers in there and a poor old customer who still wants to come into a store and do their own shopping is trying to fight against all the store pickers. You're <laughs> going to run out of capacity. That's what I'm trying to say. And things are going to get messed up. They're going to get shop soiled. There's going to be a whole range of things, but the major one is capacity. So if you're picking in store, you're going to run into shop soiling. So, you know, stuff that you're picking from the shelf where people have picked it up and put it back down. It's been in the back room a few times, backwards and forwards, and put back on the shelf. Substitutions. These things can compound themselves very quickly. And the most important thing from a logistics point of view, how many people can you get out on the shop floor, picking away, selecting, you know, customers' orders before you run out of people and space? So I would encourage people going down that path like Target have to actually move to a different solution. Certainly, and how it impacts customer service. I wouldn't necessarily immediately come to that conclusion, but after you just explained that potential scenario, very likely during the holiday season, increased demand, definitely. And so you're going to have lots of pickers because they are recruiting, I can't remember the last figure, it's like 120,000 extra people, some wow. very large number. Some of those are going to be in the DC itself, but some of them are actually going to be an expansion of individual store staff. And the view of that will be, some of those will be added to the selection team. So you've got lots more customers coming in and you're going to have lots more sales associates who are actually doing selection. That's not going to be a particularly great customer experience when I'm trying to wrestle past the selectors for a loaf of bread. 
And mm -hmm. also, if you're looking at a sort of a super store layout, if you've got you know, 100,000 square feet, 150,000 square feet, you can lose selector for 15, 20, 30 minutes quite easily, especially when you have more traffic in the store. So you then have to start thinking about, if you're going to carry on with an in-store picking selection method, you've got to say, okay, Bill, you're going to go out and you're going to pick all the tomato sauces and bring them back to me. But I'll do a secondary saw in the store somewhere and I'll pick out all these tomato sauces and push those into individual customer orders. So you introduce more complexity and more potential errors in the whole process. I would be strongly recommending that people following this path. If you've got a small volume of e-commerce, you can do it. At the scale that Target are doing it, it's time for them to start to reimagine what that might look like. Beyond a doubt, we've talked a lot about Target. Obviously, Walmart is the huge player in the space, but they're you know more value focused and they have a huge uh, increase in people using their buy online, pick up and store feature for grocery. Do you think that will eventually become an issue? They have so many people doing, you know, where they just pull their car in and the Walmart employee loads their trunk. It very much depends how they organize that. If they're doing it in store, they run into the same problem. They've got lots of selectors running around manually, assembling orders, putting them into a certain place. And of course, for any mass merchandiser, including grocery, they've got temperature control issues as well. So it's not just all hard goods, it's all the same temperature, don't worry, just pick it. If you've got freezer, cooler and dry, you've got to now do three separate picks and keep the two of them in temperature control conditions until the person comes up. If they did it at what I call the back room, in the back room, if they think that, okay, so if our stock can be split between well, let me just step back from that. If we think of expanding the back room, and I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, if we expand out at the wall from being, say, 10% of the whole building area and moved it to like 20 or 30%, because we will have less stock in the store because it will all be in back room, we could have an automated system for receiving the big truckload once a week, twice a week. And there'll be algorithms which may set say put that on the shelf and we'll actually have a routine to pick it from the shelf sometimes or put out that pallet because we're running a promotion but the rest of it will be broken down into either cases or into singles and the purpose of this is then you've got a three-way split you can fulfill shelf replenishment orders on a daily twice daily basis so you've always got full shelves at certain points in the day second thing is and pick singles for home delivery. And thirdly, you can actually set the algorithm to prioritize click and collect orders. Sure. So do you foresee, I mean, it sounds like this is probably happening with a good amount of retailers currently, but expanding the back room and having a smaller format retail space for the in-store shoppers, is that something you see increasing over the coming years? It's one alternative that retailers should consider as one of the things that very much like omni-channel was over-talked and mm -hmm. we're still struggling to see, actually, do retailers really understand the customer journey and can they track the customer literally across that journey from offline to online, back to offline, whatever it might be. One of the important things that, again, got a bit over-talked was the store of the future. And the store of the future for me was the way a retailer would transition from effectively let's call it the analog age into the digital age in that recognition we would perhaps deploy once we've understood the process we want to follow we would deploy technology and we would probably have less stock in the store we would have the variety available but not necessarily physically positioned in the store it'd be say scanned or whatever from qr code or you know sure. looked up on the kiosk and all the activity would be in the back room. So my version of the future of retail is now smaller footprint stores. The back room will be expanded if that makes viable sense to actually have the stock holding in literally in the space which used to be sales space. Or it would be positioned somewhere very close to a collection of small stores. But if we, if we follow that logic, that means that if the store gets smaller, it can be deployed as a weapon into small communities more effectively. And what do you mean exactly by that? What I mean by that is that 
when I think about the UK and, and Mark Spencer, a brand that you may you may recognise, mm-hmm. um, they've just been through a huge store rationalisation program, and being a M and shopper for a long period of time when I was over there, it kind of broke my heart because both the brand itself, but more importantly, from a logistics point of view, those locations that they're rationalising, and some may be out of date, in which case they have to rationalise those because the rent's too high, it doesn't reach the market correctly, blah, blah, blah. But say their store network, say 700, I don't know the precise numbers, and they sort of said, right, we're going to take out 350 of those. So suddenly, if I'm a customer, I have to actually go further to actually go to a store on average. Mm. Now, I actually think differently about the store of future. If we can miniaturise our store and bring technology into it so we have a high service experience and the logistics is key in delivering the fulfilment, but it's done slightly differently to what it is now, we can actually have a fairly small format which can be driven into small neighbourhoods. We can have a lot more of them. We'll all leave the same sales area footprint nationally, but we'll have a lot more stores that we could capture more market, I believe. And that's an interesting idea, especially in the big cities that need smaller format stores because there's simply not enough space, but they are high revenue, affluent uh, economy in that area. Yeah, so we can pop into a mall very easily with a small, you know, we can have a 2,000 square foot store pretty easily. And we can actually offer the whole range of what would be effectively a small superstores range or uh, assortment could be, but we would have just key elements. Maybe if we're in a gross, we'd have some fresh and the rest of it could be dealt with by the logistics. If people want to come in and squeeze their tomatoes, whatever it might be, or, you know, you want fresh food. So you want to see that, but the rest of the hard goods and the freezer could actually be handled through a home delivery or a click and collect kind of operation. Totally. And I have to ask now that we've talked about this topic, what is your view on, you know, Walmart has a lot of press around their potential Walmart pantry futuristic solutions where your pantry is basically tracked by Walmart and they deliver those non-perishable goods. They restock and they actually have someone come to your house. This is the idea that they're putting out there for the future. Is that something? I mean, how would that affect the supply chain? I think you're talking about they come into your house and put it in your fridge for you. It's similar. Yeah, it's um, they have a patent that they filed for their connected pantry I don't believe it's rolled out yet, but the idea is that they would install these pantries in consumers' homes that have sensors that allow them to tell when things need to be restocked. (laughs) They'd be kind of using that as more of a predictive measure to organize their supply chain to, you know, just as it's just about to run out, they just make sure that a delivery is made so that the consumer doesn't run out. And then if they had a larger back room, they could dedicate maybe more space to uh, the refrigerator temperature-controlled food items versus the non-perishables, if in the future we all had these connected pantries, hypothetically. The whole thing's up for grabs. I think even just a small example shows how many options there are out for dealing with this. But if we just carry on with what we've got and just introduce small initiatives and say, Mr. and Mrs. Supply Chain running this, uh, just we're going to add this into your thing, get on with it. We're never actually going to get beyond, I wouldn't say traditional bricks and mortar weekend with a few initiatives and I think that the time is right here in Canada and probably to an extent south of the border to actually do a massive rethink about our supply chain our distribution networks and think firstly how are we going to create continuous competitive advantage because technology may give us a, a competitive advantage but if we're taking stuff off the shelf and implementing it our competitors can come in and go ah They've bought XYZ software. We're going to do that and get as good as those. But actually, I'll tell you what, we're going to do a little bit of customization so they lose the competitive advantage. So the distribution network or the design of dynamic distribution networks linked in with certain aspects of technology Hmm. has to create the framework for continuous competitive advantage, which really is subphrased, is continuous relevancy. And that's so challenging. Uh, Just thinking about your actual network, your physical stores, and changing that to support something that can be really competitive, not just the software. And I think you raised a really interesting point there, Julia, because most people, if I I went to a retailer and said, hey, guys, I'm a new supply chain guy on the block. I think your stores are part of my logistics network. 
And now I'm going to do a network planning strategy. And actually, I'll probably end up closing a few and moving them around and, you know, all the normal stuff that the logistics guys do. Can you imagine how difficult a conversation that might be? And I'm sure there'll be some expletives included in it. Yeah. But <laughs> yes. the reality is, in the design of dynamic distribution networks, the store is a logistics asset. And it must be seen to be this. And all these paradigms around, no, I'm managing the store, the store does this, blah, blah, blah. Because many of the tasks that we're asking the store to do are of a extreme logistic content. It's surprising to me that not all retailers have chief supply chain officers in their C-suite and the store still continue to run as stores. That is surprising considering the Amazon effect and the fact that consumers in the developed world are expecting one, two-day shipping from every retailer. Yes, and that should be a big trigger point. I've been advocating that not only should Prime go from two to one day, while they've got all this stock they've invested into their system to allow that to happen, they actually should just see, if I just put a little bit more stock into my system, can I actually get to same day? How possible is it to get, and certainly some of the assortment could be same day, and that would really scupper I mean, Target already on the same day. Walmart will get there in various ways. If Amazon could get there, not just in the high urban areas, but more widely than that, maybe not in the remotes and the rurals, but certainly some areas with a choice assortment, many retailers would say, how do I get to same day? I have to really rethink my business. I have to reimagine every element of this because the silos, the way we've organized since 1927 and the model that was put out there, it's not going to serve us well in the remainder of the digital age. So these paradigms are trapping retailers into, you know, if you look at Forever 21 and Sears and Toys R Us and US and whatever, there are some financial factors. But I think when you scratch the surface and say, okay, they were sometimes over leveraged with their finances and whatever. But I actually think that fundamentally, they haven't seen the problem properly. It's interesting you brought that up because on our guest the other day, on the show said the same thing. He said that Forever 21 encountered a lot of inventory issues. And I have to assume that that's in part with supply chain issues. Well, it's like a bit like rent the runway. I don't want to speak uh, badly of anybody, but in the space of less than a year, they had a supply issue. Then they had a kind of returns processing and getting it back out to people issue. That's not merchandising. That's absolutely the supply chain. The supply chain wasn't either capable or wasn't well designed, wasn't able to understand the expectation and deliver something against that. I think they implemented a new warehouse management system and maybe there were some cogs which didn't quite mesh very well. And is that common or do you think it's because their model is so different where they're accepting so much back all of the time and then putting it, you know, restocking? I think from a process point of view, you know, all retailers have to handle returns. It's just that Rent the Runway received a lot more returns proportionally than, you know, for every one that went out, one came back kind of thing. Whereas sometimes with a retailer, you sell some in your store, sell some on e-commerce, some of it comes back, some of it sticks. So with rent their own way, they would have to not only receive it, they'd have to process it, clean it, polish it up, rebox it, whatever, and put it back on the shelf. So there were a few extra process steps, but nothing more than if you could describe that labor out that a normal, well configured warehouse management system should be able to cope with it. It shouldn't be beyond the wit of man for the provider to say, ah, so you need X, Y, and Z. Okay, thank you very much for describing your process. Now we are configure the software to sit on your process correctly and speed you up. Mm -hmm. So again, it circles back to what you were saying at the beginning of our conversation about how important process is <laughs> when it comes to these things. Absolutely. The whole supply chain, if we imagine that people have different views about the supply chain, but my very simple definition, it's all the individual logistics activities, you know, demand management, you know, the warehouse shuffling around, the, the transportation planning and routing and you know, execution of transportation. All those things that are organized in an aligned process deliver value to the consumer. The supply chain is delivering value to the consumer. Uh, the supply chain doesn't exist if it doesn't deliver value to the consumer. And if we just follow that logic through from a more business oriented point of view, that this is your process for delivering value to the consumer, no matter what kind of assortment you have, if it's not on the shelf or if it's not delivered on your home deliveries, 
your brand promise isn't being delivered. So this is why I'm saying that it's time for retailers to really get a grip of their supply chain and elevate its importance as a competitive weapon to win the retail war. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I definitely foresee a lot of changes in that space in the coming years with potential quicker delivery than we're already seeing. So, but I know it's bigger than just deliveries. There's a lot of complexity there. So Gary, it was lovely to have you on the show today and I hope to have you back in the future. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some views. You've been listening to Rethink Retail. For all the latest news on commerce and trends, join the discussion, rethink.industries. Thank you for listening today. I hope the information has been valuable for you and your team. You can connect with me via the website retail.ca and go to the contact page or via LinkedIn by typing linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash last dash mile. Look forward to hearing from you and playing an active part with your supply chain and your business's transformation as you start to act boldly, think big, scale, adapt and win. Thank you.